Hello and welcome to Mr. Quaker's Teachers. In today's lesson, I'll be providing a detailed analysis of the poem She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Weights by William Wordsworth. My analysis will be presented with rolling annotations of the stanzas, lines, and important words and phrases in the poem. I'll emphasize the themes, literary devices, both figurative and poetic, tone, structure, language, etc. of the poem. To purchase the course that provides stanza by stanza, line by line, and word for word written and video analysis of all the 15 poems in the IGCSE anthology, visit MrQuakestTeachers.com. The written course has been particularly helpful for students sitting the IGCSE because it gives clear guidance on the approved writing styles. Without further ado, let's demystify She Dwelt Among the Trodden Ways by William Wordsworth. Let's begin by speaking about the poet, William Wordsworth. He was an English poet of the Romantic era. He was born on April 7th, 1770 and died April 23rd, 1850. He played a key role in the launch of the Romantic Age in English literature. So Wordsworth is seen as one of the preeminent poets of, of English ancestry. A, a brief summary about the poem before we dive in. The poem deals with the life of a, a female persona and a, a sort of secluded life or a life, a reclusive life away from the hustle and bustle of, 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 of society. And this and the idea that her life sort of made her appear like somebody who had like issues or problems. Because society looks at people who do not conform as people who have who are troubled. And the poem is very emotional because for me, I think it's like a day like, that Westworth writes to the memory of Lucy and the fact that she was somebody who people paid little or no attention to, but to him, she was somebody of, very, of, of great importance and somebody that was very influential to him. So we read the poem and then we'll dive into it and then and, and, and bring it apart. So she dwelt among the untrodden ways by William Westworth. She dwelt among the untrodden ways, beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there was none to praise, and very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in a grave, and oh, the difference to me. So one of the first things we see about the poem is that the poem speaks about the female persona who um, was what um, speaks about and, and addresses as she. And we're told that she dwelt. The use of the word dwelt shows that first, Wordsworth, Wordsworth is speaking about the past or recounting the past experience and he's also trying to tell us about the circumstance or where the person lived. He describes where she lived as, as among the untrodden ways. The untrodden ways reveals the secluded nature of the persona's life and the lack of contact between her and greater society. So she was somebody that was very private. Among suggests that she was one with the environment because she was in the very midst of it. Untrodden provides visual imagery of an area cut off from the path that is often traveled by others. So she's alone. And it's a place is, uh, where she lives is not so, somewhere that people f frequent. And so the idea of her being a recluse or living like a, uh, like a reclusive life is very highlighted or is, very, uh, is made very legible from the, from the get-go. And he continues and says, beside, the use of the word beside it tells us the exact location. Beside is a preposition. It indicates that she lived in very close proximity to what Wordsworth would later on describe as the, spring of, the springs of Dove. The use of the word springs that tells us that you know, if, you, if you do geography, for example, you know that rivers usually emanate from springs, usually at, at, atop a mountain or a hill. Springs suggest that the persona abode was located on a hill with at least two springs because the use, the use of the word springs that tells us there are multiple sources for, for, the, for the river dove or the stream dove. And this is really striking because it also suggests that the persona was in close proximity and had constant contact with life which is water, dove is like, you know, the, the, a, a river. 
And this is really important because when it comes to life, water is life, essentially. And the use of the capital D in Dove reveals that it's a proper noun. So this is a particular uh, an, uh, location, according to Wordsworth. And this is really important because we see here that the persona has a very near and constant interaction with nature. And this is really important because when it comes to nature, more people observe that people who live with nature have like other cuckoo, people who have like issues. And we are supposed to live far away from nature in brick and mortar. But here we see that she, the, the persona is indulged and is immersed in nature. He continues that he made whom there was none to praise. A maid reveals the purity of the persona. The use of the word made there, especially capital M, shows that that is like a proper noun or a word and a name, even though it's a common name as it were, it's supposed to be a common noun. We see that it's, a, it's something that was, was spoken directly to or used to address the persona while she was alive. And I think there's also a sense here that she's a virgin to the extent that she, she knows no man because that's also one of the ways that people were addressed in the past when it, when it came to the, uh, especially female, uh, female virgins. So a maid whom there was none to praise. The line also highlights the total lack of appreciation. If there's none to praise her, it means that nobody appreciated the things that she was doing or acknowledgement that was given to the persona. Nobody also acknowledged a maid whom there was none. Not a single person praised her for the things she had done. For her love for, 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 for nature, maybe the, the assistance and the infusion that she was, she was making to nature. And it continues that, and very few to love. Westworth remembers that the persona also experienced little love. And I think the little love that she must have received must have come from members of her family. And this is really touching, a very, very emotional thing, I think, for, 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 for Westworth. Because here he's trying to impress on the reader that Nobody praised her, appreciated the things she was, she, she was doing, and nobody loved her. So essentially, she was like a castaway and someone that people failed to interact with. We see the use of the colon in the, as the last line of the first stanza. The colon concludes this, the, the, the stanza and shows that or signifies that what's what wants to provide more information of the, of the persona's life. And this is also an enjambment as well, because there's a lack of end punctuation. Enjambment um, what sort of employs in German in the first stanza to reveal the perfect unity that existed between the persona and the surrounding. So it doesn't end the idea of a surrounding in the first stanza. Instead, he sort of allows it to flow into the second stanza to reveal visually to the reader that there exists there this perfect union between the female persona and the environment. The enjambment continues into the second stanza of the poem. And this is evidenced by the lack of end punctuation from the first to the second stanza. When I speak about end punctuation, what I mean is that we don't see a full stop, a question mark, or an exclam exclamation mark. What we see instead is a colon, which reveals that his, um, what's what is about to provide more details for the reader. It continues into the second stanza and says, a violet by a mossy stone. So we see the first introduction of, or the first use of a metaphor here, violet. The use of the word violet attributes colorfulness vibrancy and tenderness to the persona so she's a violet so she's very colorful she's very vibrant she's tender she's somebody that is essentially a manifestation of beautiful nature a violet is a very you know beautiful flower and that's the first attribute that uh, what's what makes to the to the persona then he continues and says by a mossy stone now we see the second use of a proposition as well so she's close in very close constant relationship with the, what he describes as a mo mossy stone. The mossy stone is a second metaphor. Mossy stone suggests that her environment was an eyesore, unattractive and inhospitable. So the mossy stone, the mossiness of the stone was something that she had to deal with regularly. The metaphors create a sharp contrast between the persona and the environment. So the persona is extremely beautiful, but her environment is, is ugly. She's very tender. Uh, 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 her environment is brute. She's very hospitable and someone that is vibrant. Her environment is unattractive and inhospitable. So there's this con construct, um, contrast or just a position that was what used to provide very vivid imagery of the persona's relationship with the environment. And I think this is an important point when it comes to writing about the poem because this contrast shows us that sometimes or more often than not, people can be affected by the environment in which they find themselves or positively or negatively and in this in the case of the persona it was negatively 
And he says that the negative effect of it is presented in the fact that she was half hidden from the eye. So the use of the word half hidden from the eye suggests that the persona was negatively affected by environment. So think about it, it's almost as if 50% of her exposure was being hidden by the by environment. So 50% of her was blocked. Environment impeded her exposure, shine, and her life. Half of what she she was 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 never witnessed due to her environment. So because of the place she found herself, you know, the hostility with which people deal with her and then the lack of praise and the lack of love that she experienced, 50% or half of her life was not seen by anybody and that made it appear as something that she was not. We see that the second line of the, the, of the second stanza ends with an exclamation mark. And the use of the exclamation mark reveals that what's what was hang angered and unhappy about the persona's experience so it's like he's trying to shout and make his point with, by shouting or raising his voice it also indicates that he screamed which indicates that he was emotionally invested in the life of the persona so he wasn't just speaking but he was speaking with annoyance and unhappiness with the kind of experience that he for him he thought that was an unfair um experience by the persona we also see the use of the dash in the third line the dash reveals that what's what paused to catch his breath and compose himself after his, he let out the screams almost as if he shouted and then he's ruffled himself up and he has to compose himself and after the composure he says fair as a star now the use of the word fair as a star there's a simile it suggests that the persona was beautiful so we see here that your attributes or what's what sort of um and packages the attributes of a star and confesses it on the on the persona. He says that affairs as a star, the use of the word fair as a star presents the persona as somebody who was very beautiful, radiant, extraordinary, and somebody that was even celestial. So she wasn't of this world as it was, almost as if she was a divine being. And he says that when only one is shining in the, in the sky. So we see again the use of enjambment, the flow of words from the third line to the fourth. When one, only one is shining in the sky, attributes a sense of self-sufficiency to the person. So she's self-sufficient. So if she's the only one that's shining, if she's the only one that's in, in an environment, it's okay because she's self-sufficient. She doesn't need anybody to shine or to, to have a life. So he says that she did not need company to be remarkable. She was already remarkable by herself. It also suggests that she was inherently full of life. So she didn't need help from anybody to live she 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 got out, she sort of get got her own life from her environment and this is really important because as it shows us that the persona was somebody who was self sufficient the idea of self sufficiency again is, is again thrown up the enjambment in the stanza that sees words flowing from one line to the next reveals certain things about the the persona it says that the persona and the environment are inextricably connected you can't extricate her from environment she's fused to it she's free and does not need any assistance to survive that's also one of the the, the ideas that is presented by the uh, the enjambment she's free the persona is free and doesn't need help from anybody or society to survive in the third stanza of the poem now Westworth again goes back to how the the condition or the the, the way of life of the persona he describes her as somebody who lives who lived unknown again the use of the past tense there tells her that she she is no longer he, he's speaking about the past experience he says she lived unknown the persona lived an obscure life and very extremely private life so she wasn't somebody that was known by, every, by, by people she was very private like an unknown if, it, if someone is an unknown it means no one can fully understand the person he also continues as and few could know so and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. The use of the word that and few could know shows us that she was unnoticed and unacknowledged. And we know that society judges a person's worth by the amount of people that show up at their funeral. Her treatment means that she was inconsequential because no, not too many people showed up at her funeral or even knew that she was dead. By that um, gauge, it presented her as somebody who was very inconsequential. But what's what mentions her name in the tenth line, he says, "When Lucy ceased to be, the mention of the word Lucy reveals the identity of the person, and, and that's something that you don't see often in in, in poetry or in, in poetry where people, most of the personas are presented as people who are unknown. But here we see that her name is mentioned. 
He says when Lucy ceased to be. So Wordsworth wants to be like the voice for Lucy. So he's trying to sort of be, this is like an obituary for her and he's trying to announce that she, she's dead. She's no longer about the world. So Lucy reveals the identity of the persona. He also seems to be announcing a demise to the world as a way to make people know, to announce that Lucy is dead. We also see the use of euphemism as well, which is an idea that is really presented in most of the, the poems of the IGCSE anthology when it comes to death. And you see that in Meet Them Break by Seamus Ine, when, when we see um, Big Jim Evans saying that it was a hard blow and then the, the old men saying it was sorry for your loss. And we also see that the idea of euphemism as well in other poems as well. One we see in um, Not Waving But Drowning, when the, 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 the people speak about how the circumstance of the, of the, man de the man's death, the persona's death there, when they say it was too cold, his, his heart gave way. So we see that euphemism is one of the ideas that are usually present. And I think that euphemism is usually used to show that human beings deal awkwardly when it comes with, with death. It's, death is not a concept that is easily for, with, for people to manage. So they deal very awkwardly with it. And he says, when Lucy ceased to be. He didn't say when Lucy died. She lived unknown and few could know when she ceased to be. So he, here we see that he tries to tell the reader that she's dead. But in a, in a much more lighter way. So when Lucy ceased to be, crazy impression that Lucy vanished rather than died. So she just vanished. So he, he plays down the idea of a death. And we see the use of a semicolon. The use of the semicolon reveals the first two lines of the final stanza. It's an independent clause. So she lived alone and she could know when Lucy ceased to be. It's an independent clause. And he wants us to handle that and take care of that, you know, the circumstance of a death. Now, he now tells us what's happening with Lucy today. He says, but she is in a grave. But introduce a contrary fact. So, cease to be, like I mentioned, creates the impression that she's vanished. But he tenses and says, but she's in a grave. She's in a grave highlights the finality and end of Lucy. She's dead. And there's nothing that can be done for Lucy. Just like nothing could be done for the, the four-year-old that died in mid term break. And nothing could be done for the dead persona in not raving but drowning. When it comes to death, death speaks of final, finality. And he also says that, there's also euphemism as well when he says, in a grave. The use of the word in a grave communicates that a persona is lounging in a grave instead of dead. So she's in a grave, you know, she's, she's having a, a swell time in a grave. And we see this idea as well in one of the most famous poems um, by that, 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 that's, that's titled, Because I Could Not um, Stop for Death by Emily Dick Dickinson. When she describes and says that she's in a grave a thousand years now. So, this idea of someone being in a grave is like there's this continuation of life, you know, after life, after, after death. And that idea is presented in the word, but she's in a grave. And it says, an O. Oh. The use of the word O oh, there provides auditory imagery of a lament by what, what's word? O oh, is an exclamation. So here we see again that th this emotional investment, investment I spoke about when it says half hidden from the eye and the exclamation mark is again presented here. It also reveals that Westworth became very emotional. He was very emotional and oh, and he was the only one that was mourning the persona's death. At, le at least in the in this the idea that is presented there, and oh, the difference to me. So for 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 Westworth, Lucy's death is something that caused him profound grief, and it's something that is very important, and it's a difference, something that has caused him a lot of emotional pain. And we see the second use of an exclamation mark as well in the last, in the last um, line of the poem. Wordsworth screams a second time to register his grief, his grief sorry, and reveal to the reader that he is unashamed to reveal the emotional effect of Lucy's death on him. So he, he, he doesn't care if whatever anybody will make of it, the difference to me. So for him, Lucy meant the word and her death is something that is extremely painful for him. We also see the use of prepositions in the poem as well a lot of preposition i think this is this is the case because the situation or when um, lucy is, is in the scheme of things is is very important in the poem so we see among in the first line beside in the second line um a violet by mossy stone in the fifth line or the first line of the second stanza and in the last line of the of the second stanza also in in the 11th line so this idea of in Beside, he's trying to tell us that the situation where she's located, Lucy's um, location. 
It's use of these prepositions review that he wants the reader not to miss the location of Lucy's abode and her final resting place. She's in a grave now. She was among, she was beside, she was by, she was in, but now, now, she's in a grave. So, the next point we see is the rhyme scheme of the poem. So, we see that the poem has an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F rhyme scheme. The use of the rhyme scheme reveals that the poem is essentially a dirge or a mournful song for Lucy from Wordsworth. So, he's trying to mourn her with a song, with a mournful song, a sorrowful song. And this is really important because... We see here that he um, 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 was what is very emotional. He as he recounts the poem, he's extremely emotional. You see that with the words. And additionally, the use of the rhyme scheme also creates the impression that Wordsworth has given a lot of thought to the memory of, of Lucy. And he wants to present a life in, in, with rhyme scheme in such a way that the reader will be able to, you know, remember it very quickly. And it's not something that I'm going to forget, but it's something that's going to stick with, with the reader. And this is really important because when it comes to death, people want to keep the memory of their loved ones alive. When it speaks, when it comes to the structure of the poem, the poem has three quatrains or four lines. Each of the, the stanzas have four lines. This reveals the deep thought that was given to the memory and the decision to eulogize mem uh, Lucy by Wordsworth. So he took his time and he wanted to present Lucy's death in a way that was really striking to the reader. The poem is made up of only two sentences. Stanzas 1 and 2 is a sentence. And stanza 3 is a second stanza. So, so the poem has only two sentences. The poem has a total of 12 lines. The lines of the poem appear uneven on the page, with the odd numbered lines appearing longer than the even numbered lines. So the number 1, for example, is longer than number 2. Number 3 is also longer than number 4. The irregular nature of the lines highlights the difference between the persona and, do and those around there. And as exemplifies how difficult it is for the personal to fit in. I, sorry, how, how difficult it was, sorry, for the personal to fit in. So the persona could not fit into an environment. So there was this sort of, you know, break between her and an and and environment because she couldn't fit into the environment. And we see that in how Wordsworth presents the, the, the line length of the poem. And that key thing we see about the poem is the use of simple language. So the Westworth uses mostly simple words in the poem, mostly to, to, to mirror or to present the simplicity of the personal's life. So we see very uh, monosyllabic or, or, or two-syllable words, but not very heavy words to present the, the, uh, the personal's life to, as a way to express the fact that she was also somebody who lived a simple life. When it comes to the themes of the poem, there are themes like ideas like death, dealing with grief, the loss, loss of a loved one, secluded life, the life of a social misfit or recluse, the life of, of a non-conformist. So, any of these ideas can be usually used because the theme, the, the, the questions for the IGCS are usually presented with the themes. So, a question that can be asked is, how does William Wordsworth powerfully present dealing with grief in she dwelt among the untrodden ways? Or, how does William Wordsworth show the secluded life of the persona in strikingly present the or powerfully present the secluded life of the persona in she lived among the untrading ways so those are some of the ideas that can be presented in the poem if you enjoy this lesson you can actually purchase a course that presents that allows you to customize how you learn so you can play it repeatedly and then there are also written documents of it that goes into even into more details about what you should how you should prepare so it gives you stanza by stanza and then line by line as well, written and, and written analysis of all the 15 poem, poems in the IGCSE anthology. You can also find analysis of the prose and drama components as well for the dramas like Purple Light Discourse, sorry, the drama like um, The Crucible and then the prose like Purple Light Discourse. Ideas on the themes, conflicts, etc. and information on the unseen paper as well. You can find those at mrquickestitches.com or... You can book for private tuition in Cambridge IGCSE and A-levels in English language, English literature, geography, and history. So those are things that you can do. Or you can join our tribe on, on, on Telegram. Mr. Quakers teaches IGCSE literature. Of any of those um, points, if you need help, you can also leave your comments in the comment section as well. So yeah, you can get feedback. So here I have it. The poem, She Dwelt Among the Untrading Ways by William Wordsworth. I've been demystified. Until next time, bye-bye.
So Lucy's um, location is central to the idea of the theme, and he wants us to know that she was somebody who lived, you know, and now she's dead. We also see the use of rhyme scheme as well in the poem. We see that in the word ways, the last word ways, praise, dove, love. So the rhyme scheme is an A B A A A B A B A B C D C D E F E F. So A is the word ways, B is the word dove, and we see that B B in dove and love. The use of the rhyme scheme reveals that the poem is essentially a dirge. Now, 